I'm with Canadian filmmaker Jerry Potterton. Jerry, thank you for the time today. You're welcome. You've had a very long career. Some say too long. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never can have a too long one. But you, um, you work for years at the National Film Board. Right. Your most commercially well-known piece would, was that you directed the movie Heavy Metal. That's right. Yeah. And you worked with comic legend Buster, Buster Keaton. I mean, yeah, yeah. it's a very varied body of work. You also, Dan here was telling me, hired Susan Sarandon for a film. That's true. I think it was, I think it was pretty well her first film, wasn't it? Her first film, yeah. Was it really her first yeah. film? Yeah, lovely lady. She was just great. That was when, 19, 1970, I think. So what was it that sparked you to hire her? Well, first of all, it was it was my company, Bodderton Productions, that produced the film, but mm -hmm. it was directed by Larry Kent, uh, good old Larry, maverick, yeah. uh, great guy. He's, he's made more features than a lot of people I know, and he's always gotten the money from... Anyway, he's really... Do you know Larry? I've met him a couple yeah, times. Yeah, he's a great character. Yeah. Anyway, he... Uh, we, we had that script there that he had, and um, he, he, he thought of uh, Susan Sarandon. He'd obviously seen her somewhere, somehow. And uh, she was terrific. Carol Law mm -hmm. and uh, Steve Fissette. Remember Steve? Mm -hmm. um, so so yeah. how did you come to work for the National Film Board? Because today we don't look at the film board the way it used to be. I mean, the film board was a, a major force at one time here in Canada. Oh, it was tremendous. Well, it was, it was started uh, just at the beginning of the war, or thereabouts. As a, it, it was really, well, it was John Grierson that really, and another guy, Stuart Legg, that I think really jumped in, got it all together. It really was a propaganda unit for the war effort. I mean, I think that's what it became. They did a lot of, a lot of films or during the 40s, based on that, it was really propaganda. I mean, I think they did things that made Adolf Hitler quite angry at times. The, uh, and you, yeah. your field has been animation for the most part. What, what drew you to animation? Well, I'll tell you, I was in the... Look, I started out when I was... I was always interested in the theatre. My, my dad was a musician on the boats going around the world in the in the 30s and the late 20s. I had two aunts that were showgirls. One of them was married to one of the last of the English West End London um, actor managers, the Whitehall Theatre. And one day, just before I went into the Air Force, I was drafted for two years in 1949. Um, I got a call from my uncle and he said, would you like to come and work in the theatre? as a call boy over Christmas, they're doing Treasure Island. And uh, the guy that was playing Jim and the Beatles, he was gone, he became another friend. This was like 1948, 47, 48. And uh, I said, wow, well, this acting racket seems pretty nifty. You know, you go out there and, you know, I like the idea of you know, the audience appearing through the curtains, the excitement of the theatre waiting for the show to start. And he said, well, come along with me one night and we'll meet my agent. The woman's name was, she was Valerie Glynn. She was a top London agent. When I got there, there was this chap and a girl, a beautiful girl, and it was Jean Simmons. And they were both taking the call for David Lean's Great Expectations. Wow. So I had a chance right there to play the young Pip in Great Expectations, which would have been great but they picked this other guy, a guy called Anthony Wager. I, you know, just happened to remember these names, you know. Well, certainly Gene Simmons. And, um, but I had a great time, and then I got drafted into the RAF. And um, when I came out, after two years, um, didn't know quite what to do. I'd gone to art school when I was 15, 16. So I liked, I liked art, I liked drawing, I liked the acting thing. And I, you know, I already love stuff like uh, Bugs Bunny and, you know, all that stuff. Mickey Mouse and so forth and so on. And um, Were you a fan of animation at that point? Were there certain animators you already liked? or? I, yeah, I was already sort of aware of it. Um, well, as I was saying, you know, I think, well, Tom and Jerry and stuff, Sylvester the Cat, that was already underway there. 
And a remarkable thing, years, years later, I actually found myself working with some of those very guys, guys like Chuck Jones and wow. we did in 76. Well, Chuck used to come up to Montreal quite a lot. Great guy and um, great sense of humour. Did you ever meet him, Dan? In, in, uh, in Venice. Oh, you met him, Dan, yeah. yeah great character, great practical joke player. With, you know, him and Frizz Freeling, they're always <laughs> playing jokes on each other. Anyway, um, where were we? Okay, so um, the, the Air Force, out of the Air Force, <clears throat> and I bumped into a very nice girl called uh, Beryl Stevens, and she was working in a little shop in Soho doing hand-painted neckties for this chap. And there were a bunch of artists there painting. And uh, she said, well, they're looking for young, young people to, to do that. So I got in there for a bit. <clears throat> and then after time, she said, oh, my husband had just got a job doing backgrounds on an animation film called Animal Farm. Oh, wow. George Orwell, and it, was, it was produced by Louis de Rochemont, an American producer <coughs> who ended up doing, I think it was Windjammer, Cinerama. Remember that? Louis de Rochemont. When the screen, you know, like a big Windjammer crossing screen, suddenly hit middle screen, it would jog a bit. It never quite matched, but it was big screen, you know. <coughs> anyway. And we had these guys, a guy called David Hand, he was a director, ex-Disney character. Um, and a whole bunch of animators from all over the place. And anyway, I ended up two years working on Animal Farm, mainly working on the pigs, Major and Napoleon and all those characters. And mainly, uh, just as an assistant, you know, doing I was doing clean-up drawings. So your first taste in commercial animation was Animal Farm? That was Animal Farm, yeah. Wow. yeah. What a project to break into. I was really lucky. Uh, anyway, that film still actually stands up pretty good. Well, it's a great story, you know. So when you watch it, you recognize your work? Well, for me, I mean, all, I worked on All the Pigs with a terrific animator called Eddie Radich and his assistant called Richard Cox. And in the end, there was another guy called John Dayborn who was working it. And John, was, he was already doing a, his own amateur feature film at home, upstairs in his room called The History of Walton on Thames. It was charming, actually, and he was a very clever guy. And he ended up getting a camera. It was a wartime gun camera. It was a 16mm. They used to go in the wings of the Spitfires and whatever. And I found that out later when I went in the Air Force, too. I mean, I knew about these things. And, um, no, of course, I'd already been in the Air Force. But I knew, knew a bit about the gun camera. Anyway, he had bought this camera for five pounds, which was like ten bucks, right? And the film fit, and he said, Jerry, I've got an idea for a little stop frame film. And at that time, that was 1953, we'd already seen McLaren's Neighbours, which was shot by Wolf Kerner guy in Cine Codex Special. Stop frame, just tip, 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 like that. So he, so we ended up doing, making a little tiny film, an amateur film, called Two's Company. We did it while we worked on Animal Farm in our spare time, like, you know, evenings and mm -hmm. little bits out in Hyde Park and stuff like that, tests and all the rest of it. Anyway, John made this film and it was, it won the top, the top eight amateur films in Britain at one time and it was a little, we, we started a group called the Grasshopper Group. And it was all because of that little tiny film on I mean, it. And John was a great, great character. And then I decided after a big smog, there was a whole week of terrible smog in London, and 6,000 people died. They couldn't From breathe. smog? Yeah, oh, it was a terrible smog. That was in 53, I guess. And it was called the Great Killer Smog. And because of it, they eventually the government banned all coal fires. In London. So now the air in London is clear as any city you're going to go into because of that. They cut no more smog, you know, it just doesn't happen. Anyway, well, river fog, but it's not it's not the way it works. So you gave up acting at that point? So I I thought, well, the thing yeah, about animation, the thing I liked, it combined acting and drawing. <laughs> so I think that's the thing that drew me to it in a way. And, um, but we saw that. One night in a news theatre, Piccadilly Circus, Richard and I, the guy that I 
was his assistant. He was assistant to the Eddie Radich, the pig, main pig animator in Animal Farm. We wandered into the news theater and we saw a whole bunch of amazing shorts, uh, including, at that time, including uh, Neighbours, mm -hmm. the Clarence film, which just bowled us over completely. And strangely enough, a film, I always remember the title, Welcome to Yoho Valley. It was probably Crawley Films, in other words. It might have been outfit up in, in uh, Banff or, or uh, Calgary, I can't remember. Anyway, it showed that picture of, and don't forget, we could hardly see the screen because it was so smoggy, even in the theatres. But it always struck me, the clear, beautiful picture of Canada, and the mountains and the streams and the way we love to think, mm -hmm. that everybody thinks about us, you know. And I thought, wow, I said to Rich, hey, why don't we go out and live in the Rocky Mountains, get a nice little cabin? Because at that time we were also doing, we were doing freelance gag cartoons for newspapers and magazines, stuff like <laughs> that. And we were doing pretty good. And um, because you, you can do it anywhere, you just draw these things, you send batches into all these various newspapers <coughs> and magazines and stuff. And then... Um, you get nice money. In those days, it was, you know, for a good drawing. Anyway, what happened was, we, I took him into emigrating to Canada in 54. We both came out to Canada, and uh, we ended up not getting a job immediately with the National Film Board, although I kept applying. <coughs> we ended up doing commercials. Uh, probably the first animated commercial was done in Canada, I'm not sure, for a, an outfit in... Ottawa on Spark Street called Jack Snow Credit Jewelers and Jack had this old German guy who had a little uh, he had a Bolex 16 Bolex and we did the whole you know we just worked on this big feature film 35 millimeter big widescreen Technicolor you know and there was this little guy his name was Matthias a <laughs> funny guy anyway and uh, Jack Stokes was always, I mean, uh, Jack, um, what's his name? Uh, oh, God, Jack Snow, that's right. Jack Snow would come in and say, what's all this rubbish? And he'd throw the papers all over the place. And he could, because he was paying us to do this film. And we would, what it was, he had a big jewellery store. Okay, and we were doing a little black and white, I think a one minute commercial about selling Jack Snow jewellery to... Uh, Inuit people mm -hmm. or Eskimos as they were Snow, in those days. Snow yeah. It was a silly idea and we had little penguins in it on parachutes dropping diamonds onto the far north. It was good. we actually got it finished. And then one day I got a call from someone at the film board to say, Oh come and have a <coughs> come and have a uh, interview and I went in and I got I got the job. I was lucky.